Greetings and welcome to part two of the five second comings of Jesus Christ. In the first video, we talked about how four second coming events will culminate into a final event that will occur at the Mount of Olives. In this video, we're going to cover some of those same events again. But we're also going to look at the second coming from a different perspective. It's a perspective that the scriptures call the great day of the Lord. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but this is, of course, an expression of my own views on the second coming and how events will play out in the last days. And now, let's have a look at some second coming events and this very important event, the great day of the Lord. After his resurrection, Christ spent 40 days with 500 of his disciples, teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. On the day of his departure, they had just one question for him. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Something to keep in mind is that by this time, it had been a thousand years since Israel had been a united kingdom. After the death of King Solomon, the kingdom was split in two and became the northern kingdom of Samaria and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. The southern kingdom was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire in 687 BC. After a 70-year exile, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem under the Persian conqueror Cyrus the Great, and eventually they rebuilt their temple. They got along well with most of their Persian rulers, but they were no longer sovereign. They were now an occupied nation. They were then occupied by the Greeks. For a time, Israel enjoyed some independence under the Maccabees, who were able to shake off the Greek occupation. But by the time of Christ's ministry, they had been occupied by Rome for about 90 years. So that was the state of Israel at this time. The dream of an independent and completely restored kingdom of Israel was a hope and prayer that had burned in the heart of Israelites for a thousand years. They wanted a Messiah who would come to Jerusalem, take the throne, throw out the Romans, and restore the kingdom. And it was the intention of Jesus to eventually become their king. But the Jews had a very different idea about how that restoration would take place. But not these disciples. These disciples were not Gentile converts. The gospel had not yet been preached to the Gentiles. These were Jews who had converted to the gospel and stayed loyal to Jesus throughout his ministry. They accepted now that he wouldn't be their political Messiah. And they were not making any more assumptions at this point. They just knew that Christ would eventually restore the kingdom. It's what he had been teaching them about for 40 days. So they asked the question, are you gonna restore the kingdom now? Or is that coming later? Acts chapter 1 verse 7 and 8. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So Christ is not telling them exactly when, but he does tell them what the next step is and the part they are to play in it. He tells them to go out and preach the gospel to all the world. He tells them to build up the spiritual part of the kingdom. 
the kingdom of God must be established spiritually first, and then the political kingdom will come sometime after that work is complete. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. So Christ leaves his disciples, ascending up from the Mount of Olives and disappears into a cloud. But then two angels appear, and they are going to give the disciples some further answers to their question. Acts 1, 11 and 12. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem about a Sabbath day's journey. Christ spoke of his return many times to his disciples, but this was the first time they got some exact details about how he would return and where the location would be. He ascended up from the Mount of Olives and he would return to the exact same spot. Or would he? Was he talking about the Mount of Olives or would his return be a little different than his departure? This painting of the Second Coming is probably the most familiar one to Latter-day Saints. Here we see Christ dressed in a white robe and surrounded by angels. This is another image associated with Christ's return that you may be familiar with. This is a painting by John McNaughton. John is a very talented Latter-day Saint artist. But here Christ looks a bit different. He's dressed in a red robe, along with a host of angels that are about to descend from the clouds to unleash judgment on the nations of the world. DNC 133, 48, and 49 talk about this event. And the Lord shall be red in his apparel, and so great shall be the glory of his presence that the sun shall hide his face in shame, and the moon shall withhold its light, and the stars shall be hurled from their places. Another painting by John McNaughton. It's the same event, but Christ is now on a white horse. Christ will be on a white horse for this event. Revelations 19, 11 and 13. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war, and he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. These are two different events, and both are associated with Christ's return. But which one is the second coming? Now, in my first video, I argued that this is the second coming, the Mount of Olives. This painting would be depicting that. Christ is about to descend to the Mount of Olives, split it in half, and defeat the Gentile armies surrounding Jerusalem. But since I made that video, I've discovered that a good many Latter-day Saints see it a bit differently. They believe that this is the Second Coming. In fact, I'd even say that my viewpoint is very much in the minority. This is an article from LDS Living that you can find online. It's entitled, Three Appearances Before the Second Coming by Matthew B. Brown. According to the author, the three preliminary appearances are Adam on Diamond, the New Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives, respectively. And then I'm assuming that this is supposed to be the second coming, though the article never had a thing to say about it. That was a little irritating, especially for someone like me who believes the Mount of Olives is the second coming. I'm fine listening to other viewpoints as long as they provide an explanation. Now, I suppose the logic of the article seemed to be that of simple chronology, since this is the final appearance.
appearance of Christ. It therefore must be the second coming. Not long ago, I went to a fireside where a sister spoke about the second coming. And she also believed that this is the second coming, but also did not elaborate too much on it. Her main focus was on preparing for the second coming rather than explaining what it is. And it was a pretty good fireside. And one might argue, does it really matter which specific event is the second coming as long as we're doing everything we can to prepare for it? And from that perspective, no, it doesn't matter. But if we want to come to a better understanding of what the second coming is, then yes, it does matter. The first time I ever heard about this event was from my high school seminary teacher, Brother Hildebrandt. He showed us a picture of it, and I'm not sure who painted it, but this one looks very close to the one he showed us. And I kind of remember what he said to us. He said, this is how Christ will look at his final appearance. He will be on a white horse and dressed in a red robe. I understand this is not the image of Christ's return that you kids are used to, but this is how he will appear when he comes in judgment to the world. Now, I took note of that. I never forgot that teaching moment. It made a very strong impression on me, but I never fully understood it either. The first point I'll touch on is the time frame between these events. I've always gone along with our more traditional way of looking at that time frame, that they will happen very close together and perhaps even simultaneously, and that they are so closely linked that there is no need to make a distinction. That is the assumption I went with in my first video. A book I would highly recommend is Gerald Lund's The Second Coming. It was originally published in 1969 and he recently released an updated version. This book is a smorgasbord of second coming scriptures and last day's prophecy. And this is what Lund had to say about these two events. The scriptures make it clear that the second coming of Jesus Christ follows very soon, perhaps even immediately after Christ's appearance at the Mount of Olives. And as we shall see also, Christ's coming ushers in his millennial reign. Okay, so Gerald Lund also believes that this final appearance is the second coming. So, uh, yes, I had a few disagreements with them as well, <laughs> but not too many. He's just echoing what just about all church members believe, that this final event is the second coming. And he also echoes the general understanding about the time frame between these events, that they will occur very close together and perhaps almost simultaneously. In fact, a good many church resources take that same position. And if they do occur simultaneously, then there is no reason to make a great distinction. They're both the second coming. But because this final event will bring about the earth's cleansing in full, it tends to get the billing as the actual second coming. As I've researched for this video, I've concluded that perhaps these events will not occur simultaneously. And there could even be a significant amount of time between them. And I want to emphasize perhaps, I'm not completely sure about that. The problem is that if we take that position, then there's some difficult questions to answer. And especially if there's a lot of time between them. But then again, if we say they're close together, perhaps even simultaneous, that raises some other questions. I will address that point more fully later on. But make no mistake, these events are closely linked. And because of that, they are easily confused as the same event. Another reason many call this event the second coming is because there's no other name for it. Most other events related to Christ's return have specific names, but not this one. 
we just recognize it as a very big event. It's Christ's final appearance, and there's no other name for it, so it just seems fitting to call it the Second Coming by default. But what of this term, the Second Coming? Where does that actually come from? Interestingly, the term Second Coming is not scriptural. You can't find it anywhere in the Bible, and it does not show up in modern scriptures either. It can be found in chapter headings, but there is simply no scripture that specifically identifies Christ's return as the second coming. It is a term that has come out of traditional Christianity, and we've taken it from that. But there are scriptures that refer specifically to Christ's return, and other scriptures that refer to his coming. And if we add those two together, we get the second coming. It's a convenient way of putting together two commonly used terms that describe Christ's advent. And there's nothing wrong with that. As I stated, the second coming as a general term describing multiple events is beneficial. But applying it to specific events, it can be misleading. And that is certainly the case with this event. In the first video, I started off with a question, what is the second coming? And then gave the general understanding in the church of what that is. I could have started off by reading Acts chapter one as I did in this video, but in the first video, I wanted to start off with a general understanding before getting into the more specifics of the second coming. But in this video, I started off with more specific details and now let's work out from there. At the Mount of Olives, Christ descended from the Mount and disappeared into a cloud. At his return, he will then reappear from a cloud and descend back down to the Mount of Olives, the same place he departed from. This will be the like manner spoken of by the angels, and thus the second coming. And I would add that the Jews today also expect the Messiah to come to that same place, though they believe it will be his first coming. But on this day, Christ does not come down to the Mount of Olives. This will be a worldwide event. Now, after Christ's resurrection, he visited many people and civilizations, and he did tell them that he would one day return. But the return that was promised specifically to his disciples was to the Mount of Olives. I put a bit of thought into this and what name I would give this event based on my research. And the best name I've come up with is the great day of the Lord's conquest over all the earth. Yeah, that's cut along but it's the term that best describes this event. And we kind of have the same situation with the name of our church. It's a bit long, but it's the name that best describes our faith. However, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to shorten the name up a bit. For this video, I'm going to call it the Great Day of Conquest. Now, there's a few reasons why I think that this name is appropriate for this event. One of those reasons has to do with that white horse that Christ will be riding, and I'll expound on that in just a bit. But there are, of course, other names already in use for this event. And here are some other names that people use for the Lord's conquest of the world. The first one we'll put up here is the second coming. Now, I've already made it clear that I don't like that term applied to this event, but it's what everyone calls it. So we'll put it first. Another term is the Lord's final appearance. This event is most certainly the Lord's final appearance, and it's a good name to add to this list. This term is used by some and in fact, I will occasionally use the term in this video, but the main terminology I'll be using is the great day of conquest. 
Now, there are other names that are in use for this event and other names that could be used. And periodically, we'll come back to this list to discuss why those terms are in use or could be used. Let's start things off with a comparison chart of the Mount of Olives and the Great Day of Conquest so we can understand their similarities, but mostly their differences. The location of Christ's visit to the Mount of Olives will be the Mount of Olives, right on top of it. The Great Day of Conquest does not have a specific location. Christ will appear from the heavens, and this will be a worldwide event. The Mount of Olives will be a visit to Christ's people. The Great Day of Conquest will be a visit to the world. And now let's talk about that horse. This is one very peculiar thing about this event. Christ is on a white horse. And what is up with that horse? He never needed a horse for any of the previous visits, so why is he on one now? Well, the horse is a symbol of conquest. In this case, a symbol of Christ's conquest over all the earth. In the ancient world, whenever a king would win a decisive battle, he would ride back into the capital city on a white horse. The white horse was a symbol of his victory on the battlefield. Ancient people, when reading Revelations, they would have understood immediately that that's what that meant. That Christ on top of the white horse was a symbol of victory. And here's a painting of Napoleon Bonaparte on a white horse. And this is George Washington mounted on his white horse, Blueskin. Blueskin was actually a gray horse, but most adult gray horses have pure white coats. Now, Washington had another horse, Nelson, which was the horse he usually rode into battle on. But in paintings, Washington is almost always depicted on Blueskin, the symbol of the conquest he had over the British. And Christ on a white horse, a symbol of his conquest of the world. And back to our comparison chart. On the great day of conquest, Christ will be on a white horse. At the Mount of Olives, Christ will be on foot. And there's a very important reason for that as well. When his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, it will cause a worldwide earthquake, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So for this event, it will be very important for Christ to be on foot, not on a horse. Now let's talk about Christ's attire. On the great day of conquest, Christ will be wearing the characteristic red robe, but he will have on a different robe when he comes down to the Mount of Olives. My guess is that he will be wearing a white robe for this event. In pictures of the second coming, he's traditionally wearing a white robe. And I think there's something to this. When Christ appeared to the Nephites, he came down from heaven wearing a white robe. White is a symbol of purity, whereas red in this case is a symbol of blood. My theory is that when Christ visits his people in mercy and love, he wears white, but when he comes in judgment, he wears red. Okay, so a white robe to the Mount of Olives and a red robe on the great day of conquest. Now, I think I should add here that the Mount of Olives will also be a visit of judgment as well as mercy. But the main focus of that visit will be that of mercy. Christ will deliver his people from the Gentile armies that are ransacking the city. The Great Day of Conquest will be an eventual benefit to the terrestrial people that are spared. But the main focus of that visit will be that of judgment. Now let's have a look at the method of judgment for these events. As previously stated, when Christ sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, it will cause a worldwide earthquake. 
mountains will be leveled, valleys will be filled, and the islands of the sea shall become land. It will transform the entire earth back to the paradisical state it had prior to the fall. But on the day of conquest, the judgment is not going to be an earthquake. Instead, the earth will be cleansed by fire. Sort of. This is another one of those perplexities about this event. The understanding we all have is that it will be a cleansing of fire. And there are numerous scriptures that indicate it will be that kind of judgment. DNC 133 verse 41 says that the very presence of the Lord shall be as the melting fire that burneth, and as the fire which causeth the waters to boil. But scriptural references for this specific event aren't so specific about fire. Revelations chapter 19 verse 20 says the only ones that will specifically receive a judgment by fire are the beast and the false prophet. They will be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. Whereas verse 15 and 21 say that everyone else to receive judgment will be slain by the words that proceedeth out of him that sat upon the horse, which is Christ. And that is kind of vague. A judgment by verbal pronouncement isn't necessarily by fire. On the other hand, in Revelations 11.5, we see that the two witnesses can devour their enemies by breathing fire out of their mouths. And in Revelations 9.17, the horsemen associated with the judgments of the six trumpets spew fire and smoke and brimstone out of their mouths. Or maybe it's their horses that are spewing fire and brimstone. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, there are two other judgments in Revelations that come by way of fire coming out of the mouth. And with that analogy, I think we can assume that the great day of conquest will be a judgment by fire as well to all the wicked. But here's the thing. The actual cleansing of the earth by fire, in the most literal sense, does not occur until the end of the millennium. Joseph Fielding Smith clarified this. When the millennium is ushered in, the earth is to pass through a cleansing. This will not be the final cleansing when the earth shall be consumed and pass away to be renewed again a celestial globe. But it will be the end of unrighteousness. All who have lived the telestial law, that is those who are unclean, they who are liars and sorcerers and whoremongers and whosoever loves and makes a lie, and who suffer the wrath of God on earth and suffer the vengeance of eternal fire, shall be swept off from the face of the earth. So President Smith makes it clear that the earth will be cleansed at the beginning of the millennium, but not literally consumed by fire as it will at the end of the millennium. It's a different event, but in a figurative sense, it will be a cleansing by fire as he put it, the eternal fire of God's vengeance. And we also see that not only does the great day of conquest get confused with the Mount of Olives, but it also gets easily jumbled with this other event that will occur much later. Here's that chart again, the names for the Lord's final appearance. And here we will add the cleansing of the earth by fire. It is known by that name in the church, and most of us have used that term. It just depends on the context of our discussion. And I wanted to include some context before adding it to this list. When we use this term, it is good to keep in mind that it is not the final cleansing of the earth by fire, but it is the first cleansing of the earth in that way. One more thing before we move on, 
I'd like to comment on this scripture in Matthew 24, 39 to 42. In this passage, Christ is prophesying about the last days, and this may provide some explanation of exactly how judgment will occur on the great day of conquest. It says, And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now there has been some disagreement on how to interpret this passage. Some think that the ones taken are those who will face judgment. As in the days of Noah, they will not see it coming. When Christ comes with his heavenly army, they will have a full knowledge of everyone who is marked for judgment. And in most instances, they will be able to target them with pinpoint accuracy and basically incinerate them on the spot. And the righteous who may be working right next to them will be standing there dumbfounded as to what just happened. Now, others see the interpretation differently. They believe the righteous are the ones that will be taken and thus spared from judgment. This is the time when they will be caught up to meet the Lord at his coming. And when we consider the Joseph Smith translation in Luke that talks about the same event, there is a strong basis for that interpretation. Luke 17, 36 through 38, the JST. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord, shall they be taken? So they are now asking him to interpret this prophecy. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is gathered, or in other words, whithersoever the saints are gathered, thither will the eagles be gathered together, or thither will the remainder be gathered together. This he spake signifying the gathering of the saints and of angels descending and gathering the remainder unto them, the one from the bed, the other from the grinding, and the other from the field, whithersoever he listeth. Okay, so what Christ specifically taught is that it is the righteous who will be taken. This will be part of the gathering process and very likely associated with the Mount of Olives, when the saints who have slept shall rise from their graves and the saints who are alive shall be quickened and caught up to meet the Lord at his coming. So the JST would seem to negate the first interpretation I gave, but not necessarily. Bruce R. McConkie provided the following commentary on this passage. These words can be used in a dual way. They can be applied to the destruction of the wicked in the day of burning, when only the righteous abide the day. Or they can be applied to the gathering of the remainder of the elect by the angels when they are caught up to meet their Lord, with those who are unworthy of such a quickening being left on earth. Luke makes this latter application to words of the same meaning. Okay, so that was very nice of Bruce R. to give some latitude on the interpretation, and I'll certainly take advantage of that latitude. He declares both interpretations to be valid. Being taken can be seen as a judgment on the wicked. But as he also points out, the interpretation in Luke is specific, that this is about the redemption of the saints being quickened and caught up to meet the Lord. Now let's talk about the significance of these two events in relation to the kingdom and its restoration. The Savior's return to the Mount of Olives will fully restore the kingdom of God. And you know, I think another misunderstanding his disciples may have had at the time of his ascension is that when Christ returned to the Mount of Olives and defeated the Gentile armies, the restoration of the kingdom would begin from there. 
What they could not have comprehended is that the majority of the work of restoring the kingdom will have already been completed by then. It started at an event we know as the First Vision, which occurred in 1820, and it will finalize at the Mount of Olives. There is a tremendous amount of work to be completed between these two events, and it's a work the Church is actively involved in right now. So the Mount of Olives will not mark the beginning of the restoration of the kingdom. It will mark its completion. There will be further expansion after that, but the unification of all the tribes of Israel will come to fullness at the Savior's return to the Mount of Olives. The great day of conquest does not establish the kingdom of God. That will already have been accomplished. Will it expand the kingdom? Yes, it will in a way, but not in the way that some might think. It's not like all the terrestrial people who remain will be so excited about being spared from judgment that they're going to up and join themselves to the Church of God right afterwards. I don't know if there will be much of that at all. Joseph Fielding Smith made the following clarification. Some members of the church have an erroneous idea that when the millennium comes, all the people are going to be swept off the earth except righteous members of the church. That is not so. There will be millions of people, Catholics, Protestants, agnostics, Mohammedans, people of all classes and of all beliefs still permitted to remain upon the face of the earth. But they will be those who have lived clean lives those who have been free from wickedness and corruption, all who belong by virtue of their good lives to the terrestrial order, as well as those who have kept the celestial law, will remain upon the face of the earth during the millennium. Eventually, however, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters do the sea. Let's now talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares and how that relates to the second coming. Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So which event is this talking about? The Mount of Olives or the Great Day of Conquest? Well. Quite clearly, it's talking about the great day of conquest. That's when the cleansing of fire will take place. So that must be the case. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind about a great day of conquest. It can happen at any time. There could be a cleansing tomorrow where an army from heaven comes down and destroys the wicked and spares the righteous. But as far as the kingdom is concerned, that requires the wheat to be gathered out first, and that is a very long process. It may seem like having a worldwide cleansing of the wicked right now would be helpful to the kingdom, but this is not the case. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, 
that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. These Thessalonian saints had been suffering a lot of persecution, and here Paul encouraged them to stay true, endure it well, and these persecutions would not hinder them, but benefit them. The truth is, this fallen world provides opportunities to grow in ways that prepare us for full membership in God's kingdom. So even though the world would be a much better place if it was cleansed right now, the progress of the kingdom would stumble. So the parable of the wheat and the tares is all about the great day of conquest. And the point is that it must be put off for the time being so the saints can grow and be properly gathered. It will occur after the latter day gathering is complete. Metaphorically, it could be talking about some preliminary events that will clear the way for the second coming. But specifically, it's talking about the great day of conquest. The great day of conquest is very closely associated with the Savior's visit to the Mount of Olives. In fact, it is so closely associated, it is difficult sometimes to even know which event the scriptures are talking about. But the great day of conquest is not the second coming, at least not by my definition. The second coming will be to the Mount of Olives. And as I stated earlier, it doesn't even fit in to the second coming paradigm I went over in my first video. But it is an integral part of another important paradigm. It's a paradigm the scriptures call the great day of the Lord. In 1981, Ezra Taft Benson gave a monumental BYU devotional talk on this subject. The title of his talk is Prepare Yourselves for the Great Day of the Lord. And here are some excerpts from the talk where he explains the details of this event. I speak as one who loves you and has been given a responsibility with my brethren to testify and warn about the impending crisis facing mankind. I speak to you to the topic, prepare yourselves for the great day of the Lord. His coming will be both glorious and terrible, depending on the spiritual condition of those who remain. One appearance will be to the righteous saints who have gathered in the new Jerusalem here in America. In this place of refuge, they will be safe from the wrath of the Lord which will be poured out without measure on all nations. Another appearance of the Lord will be to the Jews, to these beleaguered sons of Judah surrounded by hostile Gentile armies who again threaten to overrun Jerusalem. The Savior, their Messiah, will set his feet on the Mount of Olives. Yet another appearance of Christ will be to the rest of the world. So the great day of the Lord is not one event, but three. It's Christ's visit to the New Jerusalem, then to the Mount of Olives, and then to the rest of the world, which is the great day of conquest. A couple things of note. President Benson never used the term second coming to describe any of these events. Instead, he refers to them as appearances. And even though he listed them in their respective order, he doesn't necessarily put them in order. Christ's visit to the rest of the world was mentioned last, but he didn't tout it as the grand finale. I think what President Benson was trying to convey is that we should not consider any of these events to be more important than the others. Because even though they are three separate appearances, they are all part of this single event, the great day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord has three main sources. It is referred to many times in scripture, but there are three specific scriptural sources that provide the most in-depth understanding of it. Two are in the Doctrine and Covenants, and that would be DNC 45 and DNC 133. The other source is the Book of Revelations. A good deal of the Book of Revelations is about the great day of the Lord. Now, President Benson did not reference any scriptures 
from Revelations in his talk, but he did reference a good many from DNC 45 and DNC 133. So let's review the second coming paradigm that I covered in the first video. The second coming is a single event, which is Christ's visit to the Mount of Olives, that restores the kingdom of God in full. It is preceded by four preliminary events that we can all term as second comings. Certain things are set in motion at each of these events that culminate at the Mount of Olives. The build-up to the millennium begins with the restoration of the gospel and ends at the Mount of Olives, with Christ's millennial reign beginning right after that. Everything prior to the Mount of Olives builds up to the unification of the kingdom, and everything after that is about the expansion of the kingdom. But in the great day of the Lord paradigm, it's a bit more complex. Christ's millennial reign does not come into being at any single event. Instead, it is spread out across four appearances. The three mentioned by Ezra Taft Benson are the New Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, and the Great Day of Conquest. And there is one preliminary event, Adam on Diamond. I'll explain in a bit why that's preliminary. But in this paradigm, Christ's millennial reign begins at Adam on Diamond. So here are the two paradigms. Well, most of the events fit into both paradigms, but a few are unique. But the question is, what is the difference between the two paradigms? And why are there two in the first place? Why is there even a distinction between the second coming and the great day of the Lord? Well, here's what it is. Each event has a different focus. The focus of the second coming is the progression of God's people. As his people move forward, so does the kingdom. Christ makes key appearances at these second coming events that give his people further assistance as they work towards restoring and building up the kingdom of God. Each event helps us get to the next major step in establishing the kingdom. Now, the great day of the Lord is more political. It focuses on how these different appearances further establish the kingdom, but more specifically how Christ's own power on earth expands with each visit. And it's the kind of thing that will make more sense with a step-by-step -step comparison of each event. First, let's have a look at Adam on Diamond. Adam on Diamond is preliminary because it is at this event where Christ is anointed king. A coronation is a very important event for any king. Now, Christ won't have a capital city just yet, but he will have a people he rules over who will build that city. And by this time, we may have already started its foundation. Now, as I stated, Adam on Diamond is not officially part of the great day of the Lord. The three sources I mentioned, DNC 45, 133, and the book of Revelations. It's not mentioned in any of those sources. And in President Benson's talk, he did not factor it in. Why is that? Well, it may be because until there's a seat of government, the political kingdom is technically not yet established. That will of course be at the New Jerusalem. And like I said, we may already be building that for our Lord at that time. But because there is no seat of government, this may be the reason why Adam on Diamond is not part of the great day of the Lord. But we can factor it in as a preliminary event. But in the second coming paradigm, the importance of this event is not political. In my first video, I did mention that at Adam on Diamond, Christ will be anointed king. But as far as God's people are concerned, it's the world events surrounding Adam on Diamond that are the most important. 
And that is the dismantling of Satan's kingdom, which starts around the time of Adam on Diamond. The dismantling will enable God's people to take the next step, which is building the new Jerusalem. The next visit we'll talk about is to the new Jerusalem. The great day of the Lord starts with Christ's appearance at the new Jerusalem, because it is here where the political kingdom is restored. It's not fully restored, but there is now a capital city where Christ will govern from directly. Now we refer to the church as the kingdom of God on earth. And from a spiritual perspective, it is, but Technically, until we have a capital city, we're not a kingdom just yet. We are still subjected to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates of the Gentile world, as we believe we should be for the time being. But once the new Jerusalem is built, Christ will be our king in every sense of it. He'll be our spiritual king and our political king. But in the second coming paradigm, the most significant event at New Jerusalem is the calling of 144,000. In the first video, I proposed that when Christ comes to the New Jerusalem temple, his main objective will be the calling of 144,000. The 144,000 will be called to further assist in the gathering of Israel. They will also be translated beings and as translated beings, they will be able to significantly accelerate the work of the Latter-day Gathering. Even with the kingdom established at the New Jerusalem, it is still a divided kingdom until the next appearance. After Christ's visit to the Mount of Olives, the kingdom becomes fully united as Judah is brought back into the kingdom. Now at this time, the Jews already have a political capital in Israel, and Ephraim, or the church, has a spiritual capital in Salt Lake City. And interestingly, after the Mount of Olives, the Old Jerusalem will become the spiritual capital of the world, and the New Jerusalem will be the political capital of the world. What we're gonna do now is back up just a bit to talk about some second coming events. The first two events in the second coming paradigm are the first vision and Christ's visit to the Kirtland Temple. Shortly following the first vision, priesthood authority is restored and the church is restored. At the Kirtland Temple, the sealing power is restored and the keys of gathering Israel. These are significant events for God's people. We can now build the church, spread the gospel, and do work for the dead. But these events do not factor into the great day of the Lord. They are still significant in the eventual establishment of the political kingdom, but they are not political milestones in and of themselves. And then at the Mount of Olives, all these second coming events and the hard work of God's people come together. This is, of course, something I covered thoroughly in the first video. The restoration, the gathering, the dismantling, translation, and temple work reach a stage of completeness. Christ's third appearance on the great day of the Lord is the great day of conquest. After that, the cleansing of the earth is complete and the millennium begins in full. It will occur shortly after the Latter-day Gathering is complete, and to that extent, it is a milestone for God's people. But beyond that, it has no significance in the Second Coming paradigm. By this time, all of God's people will have gathered to Zion. They will know of this event as it is happening, but beyond that, it is not directly relative to them. But it will be a big event for the terrestrial people of the world. After this cleansing, they will be able to put their full effort into establishing their own perfect societies. But as for the kingdom as a political entity, the great day of conquest has tremendous significance. 
Afterwards, Christ will not just be king over his people. He will be king over all the people of the earth. And what's interesting is that Christ's full rise to power follows the same pattern of all great conquerors. And now we'll take a moment to add another name to our list of names for the Lord's conquest of the world. There is one YouTuber who calls this event the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And this comes from Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 and 5. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, first off, I'll just say that I like this term and I had even considered using it for this video. But I opted not to because I couldn't find any sources in the church that authoritatively confirmed that this is the name for the Lord's final appearance. I think the assumed interpretation is that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is the great day of the Lord, but with an extra adjective. And even in President Benson's talk, he seemed to imply that when he stated that his coming will be both glorious and terrible, depending on the spiritual condition of those who remain. So it will be a great day for the righteous, but a dreadful day for the wicked. On the other hand, if we look back at those verses in Malachi, it sounds like this great and dreadful day spoken of in verse 5 is referring specifically to this cleansing by fire, this burning referred to in verse 1 that will occur in the last days. I've also noticed that the term has caught on a bit in some social media forums, and I think it's a better name to call it than the second coming. So. We'll add that to our list of names, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And now we'll move on to our next topic, the ascension of Christ as king and conqueror. Like I said, whether it's Christ conquering the world or another conqueror, it is the same pattern of ascension. The first thing a king must do is take the throne. As stated earlier, this is usually done through the ceremony of a coronation. Christ's coronation will occur at Adam on Diamond. After the coronation, they then must establish their kingdom. This involves uniting any divisions and creating a stable government. Christ's kingdom will first be established in the capital city of the New Jerusalem, which will be governed over by Ephraim. He will fully unite the kingdom at the Mount of Olives. Christ's victory at the Mount of Olives and the Battle of Armageddon will bring Judah into the kingdom and thus fully uniting the kingdom of Israel as it was in ancient times. The third thing a king must do is win a decisive battle over his enemies. This also happens at the Mount of Olives nearby at the Battle of Armageddon. And it's interesting to note that in ancient culture, a new king was not considered to be legitimate until he had won a major battle. And so it will be with this great victory. Christ's legitimacy as king will be firmly established. After the kingdom is established and the enemies defeated, there's only one thing left for a new king to do. He rides out with his armies and he conquers the world. This is what Genghis Khan did after he had united all the Mongol tribes. He set out on a campaign of world conquest, and this is what Christ will do on the great day of conquest. And it's not just the wicked that will be conquered. All the terrestrial people who remain will technically be conquered as well, 
though they will be spared from judgment. And now another jump back to our list. I want to talk a little bit about the Battle of Armageddon. It may seem like a no-brainer that the Battle of Armageddon at the Mount of Olives and the Great Day of Conquest are different battles. However, as I've studied more about this subject, I've found that a good many church resources teach them as being part of the same battle and the same war. Now, if these events occur simultaneously, as some believe, then they certainly would be. But if they don't occur simultaneously, perhaps 20 to 30 years apart, then that would require an explanation. Now, here's what I think it is. The way our linear minds work, when there are two very similar wars separated by a number of years, we tend to think of them as different wars. But the heavens don't see it that way. In eternity, there is no chronological time, no gap between such events. So as far as the heavens are concerned, if the first war never actually ended, then they're the same war. And this is why scripturally these two battles are spoken of as if they are one. For example, let's consider the American Revolution. At the end of this war, a treaty was signed which ended the fighting. However, Great Britain was still not fully respecting our sovereignty. They were impressing American sailors into their Navy. They were blocking trade. So even though the Treaty of Paris ended the Revolutionary War, it was never really settled. It would take another war, the War of 1812, before it would be settled. President James Madison declared war with Britain in 1812, and the war lasted two years. Now, we didn't do particularly well in this war, but we held our own and it was enough. The Treaty of Ghent ended the war in 1814, and this is when the conflict actually ended. And we've had over 200 years of peace with Great Britain ever since. What's also interesting is that some of the events of these wars are easily confused with each other. The Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, was written by Francis Scott Key during the Battle of Baltimore. Many think this was a battle of the Revolutionary War, but in fact, it was part of the War of 1812. And the Battle of New Orleans, where forces under Andrew Jackson routed the British and were trying to take New Orleans. This is another famous battle and popularized by the song of the same name by Johnny Horton. Now, I listened to this song quite a bit as a kid, and I assumed it was talking about the American Revolution. But once again, wrong war. It happened during the War of 1812, right at the end of it. So just as the heavens tend to conflate two similar wars, so do we. Some other wars I'll mention, but won't get into too many details. World War I and World War II. World War I never had a conclusion, and that's why a second war was fought. World War I didn't actually end until after World War II. And interestingly, these wars are also hard to tell apart. There were different battles and different generals leading those armies, but they still feel like they were all the same war. And also the Arab-Israeli War in 1948 and the Six-Day War in 1967 are similar and easily confused. Israel is still not popular with its neighbors, but after their victory in the Six-Day War, they did earn some respect. No one has tried to invade them since. And anciently, the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage. The First Punic War didn't really end, it didn't really get settled, and so the Second Punic War was fought. In fact, these wars were kind of like the World War I and the World War II of the Roman Empire. 
So what name shall we add to our list for this one? We know that this battle is part of the Battle of Armageddon. But what part? Well, why don't we call it Armageddon II? It's kind of like how we have World War I and World War II. So now we have Armageddon I that occurs at the Mount of Olives and Armageddon II that is Christ's conquest of the world. Now, I never seriously considered calling it Armageddon II for this video, but it's still a good name to add to this list. Christ's decisive victory over the Gentile armies at the Mount of Olives should establish him as king over all the earth right there. After this defeat, there is no reason for the world to think that anyone but Christ should be their king. But we know that's not going to happen just yet. It's not going to happen until the second part of Armageddon. Armageddon II, the great day of conquest, that Christ officially becomes king over all the earth. It's interesting that the gathering process takes so much time. Since the restoration, it's been going on for 200 years, and to date, membership in the kingdom has reached 16 million members. Now, I believe that membership will increase significantly after Adam Mondayamon. The gathering process will accelerate. And then the return of the Lost Ten Tribes will add even more numbers to the kingdom. And after the Mount of Olives, when the Jews are brought back in, that will be another massive increase. And by the time of the great day of conquest, how many members will, will there be in God's kingdom? 100 million, 500 million? It's hard to say, but the thing to remember is that it doesn't happen all at once. The gathering process occurs at its own pace and will reach completeness over a lengthy period of time. After the great day of conquest, Membership in God's kingdom will once again skyrocket to perhaps double, triple what it already is. And once again, we don't know how many, but we do know that the kingdom will be added to significantly after that single day of conquest. So what will be the difference between the current citizens in the kingdom and the new acquisitions? One of the problems that kings have with conquered territory is that even though the inhabitants may submit to the will of the conqueror, their hearts often remain in a state of defiance. They'll obey the new laws and pay the new taxes because they have to, but they will retain their local identities and also a hope that one day they can free themselves of their foreign rulers. There are many examples of this but biblically, the prime example are the Jews themselves. They never liked their Roman occupiers, and their greatest hope was for the Messiah to come, throw out the Romans, and regain their sovereignty. This will be very similar to the circumstances after the great day of conquest with the millions of terrestrial people who remain. Their place in the kingdom will be that of occupied territory. And once again, this is very interesting how long it takes to establish Zion. We've been trying to do it in the church for 200 years now, and we're still not there. Now, because we are striving for that, that technically makes us a Zion people. But a Zion people in the purest sense are of one heart and one mind. We haven't achieved that yet, and it just takes time to get there. But terrestrial people are not trying to establish Zion, nor are they required to. And because of this, Christ can go about with his armies, conquer the world, and bring them all into the kingdom in a single day. And Christ's rule will not be difficult for terrestrial people to live under, Christ will be the benevolent conqueror. And to understand the ways of the benevolent conqueror, let's have a look at the first great conqueror of the ancient world, Cyrus the Great. 
The term Messiah in Hebrew simply means the anointed one. And it's a term commonly associated with Christ, though it could be applied to anyone who is anointed, such as a prophet. But there's only one foreigner in the Bible who was ever given the title of Messiah, and that was Cyrus the Great. He truly was a great conqueror, but he didn't start out that way. His rise to power followed the same pattern of all great conquerors. Cyrus took the throne of Persia after the death of his father at the capital city of Pasargadi. He then brought order and united the kingdom with the conquest of the Median Empire at the Battle of Ecbatana, which was the Median capital. And what's interesting about this is that historians view this victory as a unification just as much as it was a conquest. The Medes and the Persians were culturally similar. In fact, Cyrus's empire is sometimes referred to as the Medo-Persian Empire. And even in Bible prophecy, God doesn't make a distinction between the Medes and the Persians. In Isaiah chapter 13 verses 17 and 19, Isaiah prophesies about the destruction of Babylon. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So as far as Isaiah is concerned, the Medes and the Persians are not distinguished. They are all Medes. And Jeremiah doesn't make a distinction either. So I think it's safe to assume that Cyrus's defeat of the Medes was a unification of two closely related peoples. And it is akin to the unification that will occur at the Mount of Olives. Now the Medes were also the chief rival of the Persians at that time. So the Battle of Ecbatana served also to defeat their enemies as well as unite the two kingdoms. Once again, similar to the Mount of Olives, not exactly, but similar in that their enemies were defeated and the kingdom united all in a single battle. It is a curious thing how the rise of a pagan conqueror's empire would mirror the rise of Christ's own kingdom in the last days. But during this time between the destruction of the kingdom in ancient times and its restoration in the last days, there's a lot of that kind of thing. The great Babylonian king, King Nebuchadnezzar, was seen as not just a king, but as a living incarnation of deity. He was worshipped as a god, and some consider Nebuchadnezzar to be a kind of pagan mirror of Christ as king. Now, of course, in the vision of Daniel, he saw the kingdom of Babylon and the Persians eventually get overthrown by the stone cut out of the mount without hands, which is the kingdom of God. But in the meantime, these Gentile rulers and kingdoms have some interesting similarities to God's eventual kingdom on earth. So after Cyrus took the throne, united the kingdom, and defeated the rivals, he then set out on a campaign of world conquest. He overthrew the Babylonians and many other great territories. After he overthrew the Babylonians, he allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. And this is also interesting because conquerors are typically not only brutal in conquest, but oppressive in rule. But Cyrus was a different kind of conqueror. Instead of trying to completely subdue conquered lands, he would allow the people to keep their local customs and religious beliefs. The rationale is that by being nice instead of brutal, it's much easier for conquered nations to accept their new ruler. This is the trademark of the benevolent conqueror. And I would add that Genghis Khan followed the same rule. He would conquer more territory than any other conqueror in history, and he could be a brutal conqueror. 
But after conquest, he would also show benevolence and allow conquered territories to keep their local customs and religion. Christ will also be the benevolent conqueror. He will be a brutal conqueror to the wicked. None will be spared. But he will be benevolent to the terrestrial people who remain. He'll allow them to have their own customs and religion, and they will not be required to accept his divine role as the Son of God. He'll be so nice that they may not even realize that he's the one in charge. But they will be occupied to the extent that in order to live in a terrestrial world, they must abide by terrestrial law. Christ will be the governing authority over those laws, so to that extent, he will be their ruler. One event I covered extensively in the first video was the quickening and the resurrection that was prophesied in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. My position is that this is an event that will occur at the Mount of Olives. However, others believe that this is reserved for the Great Day of Conquest. So which one is it? Well, I stand by my position that this occurs at the Mount of Olives. And even though scriptural references tend to conflate these two events, I think the strongest evidence is that this is an event for the Mount of Olives. First of all, we know of at least two resurrections that will occur at the Mount of Olives, and that is that of the two witnesses. After protecting Jerusalem for three and a half years, the two witnesses will be slain and lay dead in the streets, while the Gentile armies spend three days celebrating what they believe has been a great victory. But then a miracle happens. Revelations chapter 11 verses 11 through 13. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. This cloud has always been a kind of meeting point between heaven and earth, and we've seen it in the scriptures before. While Israel wandered in the wilderness, Exodus 13, 21 says, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. Well, after the two witnesses are resurrected, they will ascend up to this cloud to meet the Lord before he descends to the mount in judgment. And with that, I think it is safe to say that they are not the only ones who will be caught up to meet the Lord at this time. This will be that time spoken of in scripture. The righteous saints who have slept will also be resurrected, and the righteous saints still living will be quickened and caught up to meet the Lord as well. D&C 109 verses 74 and 75 also indicate quite clearly that this is a Mount of Olives event. And thy church will be adorned as a bride for that day, when thou shalt unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at thy presence, and the valleys to be exalted, the rough places made smooth, that thy glory may fill the earth. Then will the trump sound for the dead, and we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord. 
Okay, so verse 74 talks about the big earthquake that will transform the entire earth to the millennial state when Christ comes down to the Mount of Olives. However, it also refers to Christ uniting with his church on earth. You see, this is an event for God's people, not terrestrial people. And 75 talks about the resurrection and then being caught up to meet the Lord that we may ever be with the Lord. Well, the scriptures in Thessalonians also end on that same note, that we shall ever be with the Lord. You see, once again, this is an event for God's people. It's not an event for terrestrial people who don't know the Lord. So what is the point of this meeting? Well, as I stated earlier, this will be the restoration of the kingdom something that saints from all ages have hoped for and prayed for. Some have even given their lives so that this event could someday happen. Graduation ceremonies and many other similar events are to recognize and celebrate all the hard work and sacrifice that went into achieving this moment. So when the saints are caught up to meet the Lord, this will be for that very same reason. As for the great day of conquest, it would not, in my view, be appropriate for a grand celebration to occur at that time, at least not in that way. First of all, although Christ will appear in great glory, this is not necessarily going to be a joyous event. In fact, it's gonna be a very sorrowful occasion the earth must be cleansed from sin before the millennium can begin in full. So it is necessary, but it's not the sort of event that calls for a celebration. Even for the terrestrial folks who are spared, I don't know how great it will be for them. In some cases, it may be a blessing. They have some Andre neighbors they don't have to deal with anymore but they may also have family and friends who are not spared from judgment. They may show up to work the next day and find that half of their co-workers and upper management are gone. In the parable of the sower, I think this is another point the Lord was getting at about not wanting to uproot his people. There are many celestial people who are very good at business and they can be good employers to work for. It's not their work ethic that makes them telestial. But if justice were to come too early, there's many good people, including church members, who will probably be out of a job. This sends a strong message that when that call comes to gather to Zion, we should certainly do so to avoid this catastrophe. I should add that at this time we are only called to spiritually separate ourselves from the world and not physically relocate ourselves out of it. But I believe that starting after Adam on Diamond, we will see the beginnings of Zion's physical separation from the world. And by the time of the great day of conquest, Zion and the world will be completely separated. I think the parable of the wheat and the tares teaches that this is how things must eventually play out in the last days. Also, I don't think it is prudent to fixate too much on physical separation at this time, but it is good to keep in mind that eventually this will happen. I have also considered that terrestrial people may have some gatherings of their own to separate themselves from the wicked. I'm certain that will be the case for a good many. Even still, they will not be caught up to meet the Lord at this event. That will be an event for God's people and it will occur at the Mount of Olives. But it does raise the question as to how the great day of conquest will factor into the resurrection. Will there be a resurrection on that day? And if so, when will it occur? To answer that question, let's have a look at a quote from Bruce R. McConkie about the resurrection. 
those being resurrected with celestial bodies whose destiny is to inherit a celestial kingdom will come forth in the morning of the first resurrection. Their graves shall be opened and they shall be caught up to meet the Lord at his second coming. They are Christ's the first fruits, and they shall descend with him to reign as kings and priests during the millennial era. Later, another trump will sound. This is the afternoon of the first resurrection. It takes place after our Lord has ushered in the millennium. Those coming forth at this time do so with terrestrial bodies and are thus destined to inherit a terrestrial glory in eternity. I think McConkie lays it out quite clearly here. The morning of the first resurrection must occur before the millennium begins, and that will occur at the Mount of Olives. The saints who have slept and are destined for celestial glory will be caught up to meet the Lord and resurrected into celestial bodies. But for those who are destined for terrestrial glory, their resurrection will be after the millennium begins, which is after the great day of conquest. McConkie did not say that the afternoon of the first resurrection would begin immediately after that event, but I personally think that that is when it will start. It makes sense to me that the event associated with the deliverance of God's people is also associated with their resurrection and the event associated with the deliverance of terrestrial people will likewise be associated with their resurrection. However, the resurrection that will occur at the Mount of Olives will happen right before Christ's descent, not after, like on the great day of conquest. So at the Mount of Olives, the resurrection is right before the great day of conquest, it is right after. I also believe there will be a quickening that will occur at the great day of conquest. In fact, I think there must be. All terrestrial people on the earth at this time will be quickened. And this could be a third way of interpreting that last day's prophecy in Matthew 24, two working in a field and one shall be taken, two grinding at the mill and one shall be taken. Those who remain will face judgment. The terrestrial people will be quickened to be spared from judgment, but they won't be caught up to meet the Lord. Terrestrial people, although very good people, they don't really know the Lord, so it would be a rather awkward meeting anyways. And we will not be caught up to meet the Lord at this event either. Once again, the occasion doesn't call for it. These angels will not be glad to see us. We'd just be in their way. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord at the Mount of Olives. A couple more things about the great day of conquest in relation to quickenings and resurrections. Any of God's people who have not yet been quickened will at this time be quickened because there will be further gathering after the Mount of Olives and perhaps quite a bit that tells me there will still be many of God's people who have not yet been quickened and these will be quickened at the great day of conquest probably at the same time terrestrial people are quickened now, I don't have a reference for that it's just my view that that's when that will occur and all the translated beings on the earth at this time will be changed to the immortal state in the twinkling of an eye. In other words, they will be changed from a translated state to a resurrected state. And I do have a reference for that one. Third Nephi chapter 28 verses 7 and 8. Here the Lord is blessing the three Nephites with the gift of translation and explaining to them what that gift is. Ye shall never taste of death, but ye shall live to behold all the doings of the Father unto the children of men. 
even until all things shall be fulfilled according to the will of the Father, when I shall come in my glory with the powers of heaven. And ye shall never endure the pains of death, but when I shall come in my glory, ye shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality, and then shall ye be blessed in the kingdom of my Father. So Christ tells them twice that they will never taste of death. And then he tells them that when he comes in glory, they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. In other words, changed from a translated state to a resurrected state. And that's interesting because he tells them twice they're never gonna die, which sounds like they will be immortal, but then he tells them that they will not achieve the immortal state until he comes in glory. So having a translated body is sort of immortal, but not quite. It's not until we are resurrected that we acquire true immortality. And for translated beings, that's a very quick and easy change. But getting back to the point, for translated souls, that change will happen on the great day of conquest when the Lord comes in glory. Now, the Mount of Olives will be a glorious appearance and a, and a glorious victory. But when the scriptures talk about the Lord coming in glory, they are referring to that final appearance. And we will talk more about that in the next section. But I think the reason why this change will occur at this time is because the gathering of the last days will be complete. The primary calling of translated beings is to assist in the gathering of Israel. And with the job of separating the wheat and the tares complete, the mission of translated beings is also complete. Thus, they will all be changed to the immortal state at this event in the twinkling of an eye. And this will include the three Nephites, of course, John the Revelator, and all of the 144,000. The 144,000 are to be translated beings that will assist in the gathering of Israel. And they will all be changed from the mortal to the immortal state at this event. So the great day of conquest will be a busy day for physical changes. There will be quickenings, twinklings, and resurrections. It will probably be an even bigger day than the Mount of Olives for these things. But they are different events with different circumstances surrounding them. And with a better understanding of that, we can have a better idea of how all this will play out. For behold, he cometh in the clouds with ten thousands of his saints in the kingdom, clothed with the glory of the Father, and every eye shall see him, and they who pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So which event is this talking about and how will this prophecy be fulfilled? How is it that every eye shall see Christ when he comes? To a certain degree, it will be fulfilled by a sign in heaven known as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 gives the following details about this sign. And as I said before, after the tribulation of those days and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. There are two ways to interpret this. One way is that the sign and the coming of the Lord are the same thing. The other way is that the sign of the coming of the Son of Man and his actual coming are separate. And the latter is how I interpret it. Let's have a look at DNC 38 verse 8. But the day soon cometh that ye shall see me and know that I am. For the veil of darkness shall soon be rent, 
and he that is not purified shall not abide the day. So this is talking about the final judgment. The earth will be purified at Christ's final appearance. And at that event, the veil will be rent. There is a veil that separates this world from the heavens. And on the great day of conquest, that veil will be parted. Christ and his army will ride through that veil and into this world. Everyone on earth will be able to see Christ and his army riding across the clouds, and then judgment will commence. This is how everyone will see the Lord, and as I stated, that is what some interpret to be the sign as well. Now, the other interpretation is that the sign is not the Lord's final appearance, but will herald it. The logic is that signs in heaven are given to warn of coming judgment and to give mankind time to heed the warning and or prepare. By the time everyone sees the Lord coming, there will be no time to prepare. Judgment will be imminent. So the sign must be a different phenomenon. But if the sign is a separate thing, then what will that sign be? This is a quote from an LDS Living article. It's a bit more informative than the one I quoted earlier, and incidentally, it's by the same author, Matthew B. Brown. And this is what it has to say about this sign. Joseph Smith provides valuable commentary on this subject, explaining that when this sign is seen by the world's population, they will speculate that it is a planet, a comet, etc. He also said that while the wicked will not understand its true significance, attributing it to a natural cause, the righteous will know what it means, and the coming of the Son of Man will be like the dawning of the morning sun that moves along gradually from the east until it reaches unto the west. In a manner similar to the sun, this sign will be small at first, but will gradually increase until it is all in a blaze, and every eye shall see it. There was another quote from Joseph Smith cited in that same article, and this is not attributed directly to him. A close associate, Juan Mace, claimed that Joseph told him that this sign would be the return of the city of Enoch. And that's very interesting. If that is true, then that would explain more precisely what this sign is. So this will be a sign for everyone. The righteous and the unrighteous alike will see Christ coming in judgment. But is this a sign for the Mount of Olives or for the great day of conquest? Well, of course, it's talking about the great day of conquest. There will be a great importance that everyone knows this judgment is soon to take place and the earth is about to be cleansed from sin. To that extent, it's also important for those facing judgment to understand what is about to happen to them. But this is not the same as being caught up to meet the Lord, a Mount of Olives event. These two prophecies are easily confused. Caught up to meet the Lord and every eye shall see him they can be confused as easily as the bigger events they are associated with. So just to clarify, even though we will not be caught up to meet the Lord at the great day of conquest, every eye shall see the Lord coming in glory. Even though the great day of conquest is not the second coming, it is the second something. But the second what? Well, here's what it is, and it's really quite simple. After the great flood, the Lord made a promise to the world recorded in Genesis 9:11. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. There are two rites associated with spiritual cleansing. 
First there is the cleansing of water by baptism. Then there is the cleansing of fire by the Holy Ghost, which is done by confirmation by the laying on of hands. The earth must also go through this two-step process to be fully purified. The first cleansing was the great flood, which was of course by water. The second cleansing will be the great day of conquest, which will be a cleansing by fire. So we could call it the second cleansing. From the earth's perspective, it will be a cleansing. The earth will be cleansed from sin. And in that sense, we could call it that, the second cleansing. But from a divine perspective, in relation to the wicked, it isn't just a cleansing, it's a judgment. And I think that is a more appropriate term. The great day of conquest is not the second coming, it's the second judgment. And here's a quote by Joseph Smith about that. In the days of Noah, God destroyed the world by a flood, and he has promised to destroy it by fire in the last days. So this is what has been taught by the prophets. The great day of conquest will be the second judgment on the world. Now maybe some could argue, well, if it's a second judgment, then wouldn't that also make it the second coming? No, because Christ did not make an appearance at the great flood. His appearance at the day of conquest will be his first appearance to the world in this manner, not the second. However, once again, we have that other event at the end of the millennium, which will be another cleansing by fire. It will be a purer cleansing and more literally by fire than the one in the last days. Might that one be the actual second judgment? I would say no. I consider that one to be the third and final judgment on the earth. And with that, we have a seventh name to add to our list of names for the Lord's conquest of the world, the second judgment. And now I'd like to talk to you about the big mystery of the great day of conquest. It's a mystery to me, at least. It's something I've struggled to work it all out. In my first video, I talked about how careful Christ was not to put his feet down on the earth unless it was sanctified holy ground. And in all the preliminary visits, with the exception of the first vision, Christ makes landfall. The first landfall was at the Kirtland Temple, an indoor structure. The second landfall will be at Adam on Diamond. Now this will be an outdoor area, though we assume that the land will be dedicated for Christ's visit in the same way that a temple is. So it will be like an outdoor temple, kind of like the Garden of Eden. The New Jerusalem Temple will of course be dedicated holy ground on the inside, but it will also have an outer court that will be dedicated. Now for modern temples, all rites are performed inside the temple. But in the temples of ancient Israel, there was also an outside court that was used for temple rites. The sacrificial altar was in this outer court and it was used by the priests for animal sacrifice. We know at the New Jerusalem temple, the sons of Levi will be called to perform this rite again. So the New Jerusalem temple will have a dedicated outer court, at least for that purpose, and for perhaps much more. And then there's the Mount of Olives, where Christ for the first time puts his foot down on undedicated, unholy ground. The resulting paradox creates an earthquake that transforms the entire earth to its previous glorified state before the fall. In essence, it will be like one big temple dedication of the entire earth. At least that's how I understood it. But if the earth becomes like one big temple, where Christ can now walk wherever he wants, then how could there possibly be a need for any further cleansing? If wickedness continues, then that makes the ground unholy again. 
If we assume that the Mount of Olives and the Great Day of Conquest will occur simultaneously, then we have no conflict. The cleansing of the earth by fire will occur simultaneously with the worldwide earthquake. That's the position I took in the first video. But if we take the other position, that there will be a period of time between these two judgments, perhaps 20 to 30 years or so, then this becomes very difficult to explain. I have really racked my brain on this one, trying to figure out a sensible explanation. Once a conqueror unifies a kingdom, they typically don't waste much time in setting out to conquer the world. On that point, one could argue that these events should not be too far apart. And the scriptures at times sure talk about these two events as if they are the same event. But there are two reasons why I think there must be a reasonable amount of time between them. One reason is so that further gathering can take place. Christ's visit to the Mount of Olives is going to convince the Jews at Jerusalem that he is the Messiah. But there will still be many Jews scattered around the world that may not even hear about that event for a while. Now in the book of Revelations, in reference to the 144,000, John indicated that there will be 12,000 of Judah that will be called to gather. W. Cleon Skelson believes that their mission will start right after the Mount of Olives, and I agree with him on that. Now, Bruce R. McConkie has stated that the gathering of Israel will not end at the Lord's final appearance, but will continue on until the end of the millennium. And that certainly could be the case. But my sense is that there should still be a benchmark, a certain amount of gathering to be completed prior to the great day of conquest. And the second reason has to do with the resurrection. And this is probably an even stronger point than the gathering. Here's that comparison chart I used earlier. Now, if the Mount of Olives and the Great Day of Conquest occur simultaneously, that also puts the morning and the afternoon of the first resurrection at the same time. And if they are that close together, then they are pretty much the same thing. And that just doesn't add up. And I think would indicate that there must be a significant amount of time between these events. So for this one, I'm just going to put a question mark on it and say, I don't know how this is going to play out. I'm not the kind of YouTuber who's gonna tell you that I have all the answers. And for this puzzle, there's still some missing pieces and we'll just have to wait and see how the Lord is gonna work all this out. And now I'd like to talk about the unification of the kingdom that will occur at the Mount of Olives and why that is so important. After Joseph's brothers had sold him off as a slave, it set off an extraordinary chain of events. Who would have thought that by the time Joseph and his brothers would meet again, the circumstances would be so different? Joseph had become one of the most powerful men in Egypt and in the entire world for that matter. So when his brothers showed up in Egypt so many years later to buy grain, they had no idea it was their own brother they were buying it from. Well, you know the story and I won't recount all the details of it, but he puts his brothers to the test to see if they have learned anything. He makes it look like the youngest brother, Benjamin, had stolen a very valuable item and the servants find it in his possession. And now to punish him, Joseph is going to keep Benjamin as a slave and not allow him to return home to Canaan with his brothers. And when this happens, it is Judah that steps forward to plead for Benjamin's cause. And this is what he says. He first recounts all the hassle they've had so far with the demands of their Egyptian host. And he complains that they've met all the demands, and now this. 
And Judah says, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. The reason why Judah did this is because he had made a promise to his father. Jacob did not want to let Benjamin go up to Egypt. He did not want a chance losing him like he had lost Joseph. But they had to bring Benjamin. Joseph required it and they needed more food. So Judah convinces his father that if he lets Benjamin go, he would take personal responsibility for him and make sure he gets home safely. Now, this responsibility, it typically fell on the oldest brother. And in the case of Jacob's family, that would be Reuben. And you might remember when the brothers threw Joseph in a pit, it was Reuben who stopped them from killing him. So he did protect him in that sense, but he failed in his most important responsibility, which was to make sure that all the brothers came home safely. And now we see Judah stepping forward and taking on that role of the older brother. And that is a role that he will continue to hold from this time forward. So it now falls on Judah to make sure that all the other sons get home safely. And here we see Judah willing to make the greatest sacrifice. He offers himself to take the place of Benjamin. He volunteers to stay behind and become a slave in Egypt so his younger brother can return home. And it is at that moment that the brothers have passed the test. Joseph knows that his brothers have learned something and he can now reveal himself. And that moment is so emotional that he can't contain himself. He begins to weep and his cries are so loud that everyone in the palace can hear him. And when he does reveal himself, the brothers are afraid. They are still ashamed because of this terrible thing they had done to him. And Joseph senses that and he assures his brothers that they are forgiven. He says, be not grieved or angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither for God did send me before you to preserve life. So he assures him that this was all meant to be. And then he asks him to go back to Canaan and bring back their father. They can all live in Egypt now. They won't have to worry about food or money or anything else anymore. And thus the brothers were once again unified. The family of Israel was once again unified. And what a joyous moment that was. I believe that this Old Testament story is a type for the eventual reunification of Israel that will occur at the Mount of Olives. It will occur when Joseph and Judah have both reached the same spiritual level so that the reunification can occur. To that point, let's consider how far these brothers had come, that being Joseph and Judah. Joseph had, of course, become a very great man. He was one of the most powerful men in the world. Well, he was already a very spiritual young man when he was sold into Egypt, but by now, even more so. He not only could interpret dreams, but he had the gift of prophecy. And through his gifts, he had become a kind of savior to the Gentile world because he interpreted Pharaoh's dream of the coming seven-year drought, Egypt was able to prepare for that by storing up grain. And so when the famine came, they not only had plenty for themselves, but also plenty to sell to other lands that were suffering from famine. Joseph, of course, held the birthright, which was passed to his son Ephraim. And through that birthright, Joseph would once again be the means of salvation to the Gentiles in the last days through Ephraim with the restoration of the gospel and the latter-day gathering. Now Judah had also come a long way. He was willing to make the greatest sacrifice. 
he volunteered to stay behind and become a slave in Egypt so his younger brother Benjamin could return home. And this is such a powerful moment because it is in similitude of the atonement. Christ made the greatest sacrifice for us so that we can return home to our Father in heaven. And now just to clarify a few things about the birthright and the patriarchal blessing. The birthright and the patriarchal blessing were not the same thing. The birthright was more about an earthly inheritance. The patriarchal blessing was also a birthright, but it was more about spiritual inheritance. The son who obtained the birthright would receive a double portion of inheritance and would have the responsibility of taking care of the family, whoever needed to be taken care of after the patriarch passed away. The birthright and the patriarchal blessing usually went to the oldest son, but not necessarily. The father could give those blessings to whichever son he wanted. Now, in the case of Reuben, even though he was the eldest son, he was unqualified for either of those blessings. So here's how Jacob divided it up. The birthright was given to Joseph. Joseph was the obvious choice for that since he was already taking care of everyone and would continue to do so. The patriarchal blessing went to Ephraim and he became the designated eldest son of Jacob. It is through Ephraim that the blessings of the priesthood are passed down along with the responsibility of sharing the message of the restored gospel to the world. Judah was also given a patriarchal blessing from Jacob. In fact, after Jacob gave Ephraim what we could call the patriarchal blessing, he then went around to all his sons and gave each of them a patriarchal blessing as well. And the one given to Judah was a very rich blessing indeed. Now here's the full blessing in Genesis chapter 49 verses 8 and 12. And if you look at verse 10 there, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall a gathering of the people be. So the blessing given to Judah's posterity is that they would be the great rulers of the earth. And it was through Judah that Israel had some of its greatest kings. Even Christ, the great king of all kings, came through the line of Judah. Judah also became the designated eldest son of Jacob. So Israel had two eldest sons in that sense. At that moment, when he promised his father that he would make sure Benjamin came back home safely, he became Jacob's designated eldest son. And that role was never really taken from him. But once again, this was an earthly inheritance, whereas Ephraim's inheritance was spiritual. We talk of our own divine inheritance to become kings and queens, priests and priestesses. Kings and queens rule over the earth, but priests and priestesses can call down the powers of heaven. Judas' posterity was given the blessing to rule over the earth and Ephraim's posterity to rule from the heavens. We see this even today. Israel, or Judah, is once again a mighty earthly kingdom in the east. But the church, which is Ephraim, is the mighty spiritual kingdom of the west. And when the Savior comes to the Mount of Olives, those two mighty kingdoms become united. And now a little about myself. When I was two days old, I was adopted. My parents are Latter-day Saints, and thus I was raised in the church. Through adoption, I have a lot of pioneer heritage, particularly on my mom's side. My great-great-great-grandfather is Israel Barlow. 
Israel Barlow was a prominent figure in church history, a great colonizer for the church, and he was also a bodyguard to Joseph Smith. Now, a few years ago, through DNA testing, I was able to find my biological parents. My birth mother is also a Latter-day Saint, and she also has a lot of pioneer heritage. Through her, I am related to Charles Shumway. He is another great, great, great grandfather. And like Israel Barlow, he was a great colonizer for the church. In fact, he led the first group of saints out of Nauvoo. And he was also a bodyguard to Joseph Smith. I can't help but wonder if both of my great, great, great grandpas, Israel and Charles, if they were ever on guard duty at the same time. Now, my adopted parents had enough information for me to know that I was probably related to Charles Shumway. So that's something I've always known and it was confirmed with DNA testing. So I have strong pioneer heritage on both my adopted and biological side. My birth mother got married a few years after she had me and began raising a family. Now on her side, I have three sisters and one brother. And I gotta tell you, it's been a lot of fun connecting with my long lost siblings. My biological father was a Jewish guy. The adoption agency had shared that information with my parents and they shared it with me. So that's another thing I've always known and it was confirmed with the DNA testing. Unfortunately, my biological father had passed away before I could meet him, but I have been in contact with a brother and a sister on that side and they're both wonderful and it's always a blast meeting up with them as well. I've even met some Jewish cousins. I met up with cousins on the West Coast and I even flew across the country to meet another cousin in Florida. I've had such nice meetings with all of them and it's been worth every moment of it. And it continues to be a blessing as I get to know more of my Jewish family. My point is that when we're all caught up to meet the Lord in the air, I sure hope we're not all floating around up there and wondering what the big deal is. The victory over the armies of Gog and Magog at the Battle of Armageddon will be the greatest battle that was ever won. The great day of conquest will be the greatest single day of conquest the world has ever seen. But the reunification of all the tribes of Israel that will occur at the Mount of Olives will be the greatest of all these accomplishments. The first two events are things the Lord can take care of himself. But the reunification of the kingdom is a joint venture between God and his people. He can't do it without us. And when that labor is complete, it will be the greatest thing that we've ever been part of as well. So for the people of God, the Mount of Olives is the big deal. In my last video, I talked about a book called The Fourth Turning. Every 80 or 90 years, there's a big reset in the world and a new age begins. I released that video in May of 2021 and in it, I theorized that the big turning could happen that year. If there was a turning point, it would no doubt have been the disastrous pullout from Afghanistan that occurred in September of that year. It marked 20 years since the 9-11 attacks and the 9-11 attacks were another warning to repent. The Afghanistan pullout was perceived as weakness by other world powers and it led directly to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It hasn't been since World War II that the world has seen a massive invasion like that. And it remains to be seen how this will play out. Could the aggression stop there? Or is it the first of other dominoes to fall? Along with war, we've had soaring energy costs. Inflation 
is at record levels, there continues to be civil unrest, and we have a host of other problems. So things are definitely bad. However, I thought they'd be much worse by now. So we are very fortunate. Even still, things will probably get worse before they get better. My projections were that the current age could reach its end by around 2024 or 2025, but it could take longer. According to the authors of The Fourth Turning, the current age should come to an end by no later than 2030. Here's that list again of all the names for the Lord's conquest of the world. There could be more I didn't think of. And I'm not here to tell anyone what to call it. You can call it whatever you like. Use any of these terms you feel comfortable with. And you can even use more than one of these terms, depending on your topic of conversation. So let's go over these second coming paradigms one more time. The Mount of Olives is the second coming. The Great Day of Conquest is the second judgment. These two events are closely associated and often spoken of as the same event in Scripture. When we add a third event, Christ's visit to the temple at the New Jerusalem, we have the Great Day of the Lord, which comprises all three of these events with the establishment of his kingdom, the unification of his kingdom, and the conquest of the world, it truly will be a great day for the Lord. The great day of the Lord also has one preliminary event, Adam on Diamond. Christ's coronation as king occurs here, and this is where Christ's millennial reign technically begins. As I've stated, these events are political. With each event, Christ's power increases until he reigns supreme over all the earth. Events of the second coming paradigm are more personal. It's Christ working more directly with his people to establish his kingdom. It's a total of five visitations, the sacred grove, the Kirtland temple, Adam on Diamond, the New Jerusalem, and finally, the Mount of Olives, which is Christ's promised second coming to his people. His millennial reign over his fully united people begins here. These two paradigms, the great day of the Lord and the second coming, are like two hands held together in prayer. Christ's ascension of power on earth and the ascension of his people to the millennial Zion state are going to bring about the paradise on earth that so many have prayed for and waited for throughout the ages.